lifting others up. I would like to begin with a poem this morning written by a Poland poet, Wyslawa Zimborska. She is well known in her native land. She's received international recognition, especially when she won the Nobel Peace Prize for literature um, in 1996. Wyslawa, through an intelligent and empathic exploration, explores philosophical, moral, and ethical issues. Wazlawa strives to illuminate the deepest problem of human existence, surrounded by the transitoriness of the now and everyday life. I just learned of her when I was in my devotion, stumbled across one of her poems. This poem is entitled, A Word on Statistics. Out of every hundred people, those who always know better, 52. Unsure of every step, almost all the rest. Ready to help if it doesn't take long, 49. Always good because they cannot be otherwise, four, well maybe five. Able to admire without envy, 18. Led to error by youth which passes 60 plus or minus. Those not to be messed with, 40 and 4. Living in constant fear of something or someone, 77. Capable of happiness, 20 some odd at most. Harmless alone, turning savage in crowds, more than half for sure. Cruel when forced by circumstances, it's better not to know, not even approximately. Wise in hindsight, not many more than wise in foresight. Getting nothing out of life except things, 30, though I would like to be wrong. Doubled over in pain and without a flashlight in the dark, 83, sooner or later. Those who are just, quite a few at 35. But if it takes effort to understand, three. Worthy of empathy, 99. Mortal, 100 out of 100. A figure that is never varied yet. With statistics, this author has found a way to cause us to look at the messiness of human nature. Where statistics are usually cold and unrelenting, here they are uncertain and draw us to the question of life. This dance we do that sometimes is smooth but sometimes leaves us stepping on one another's feet. This dance that sometimes has us dancing to different dancers all the while trying to make it work dancing together. This dance to go along, to get along, even while we have questions deep inside. This dance where what is real is as far from the surface as we twist narratives of hope rather than the truth. In this poem, she explores the human soul's ability to do good, and yet its ability to not wish good for their neighbor. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jesus and the religious leaders have been dancing together for a while. And the feelings that they had for each other were mutual. And the tension was like a thick slab of baloney. And you know when you know and someone's been riding your back and you know they don't like you, the juice on your eyeball even, it creates human statistics. And Jesus goes on the offense. He's trying to tag them without tagging them in his soliloquy of words. First set of words out of his mouth is, you can listen, but don't do as they do, because they don't even follow their own words. Jesus is not pulling any punches today. Be clear, he is on the offense. Enough is enough, and the religious leaders are on the defense as well. When the religious leaders hear what he has said, they like, he's talking about us. Arrest him. 
and the dance continues. This isn't their first dance. This isn't their first conversation. This wasn't their first going back and forth. This wasn't their first. I gotta have the last word. I gotta have the last punch. The one thing Jesus had going for him was Jesus was a truth teller. You might not like how he said it and when he said it and the way he said it, but Jesus could get you told, and it was the truth. He was pretty honest, and another statistic is often when we get beside ourselves, when folks tell us the truth, we won't feel so great about them, do we? And what Jesus said here is you guys are always lifting yourself up. You don't wait for a compliment. You give yourself one. You're always tooting your own horn. It's always about you. You're always having to put yourself up. You guys are a piece of work. You guys want to be seen. You choose power. You choose position. You choose privilege. You choose it all, what this world has to offer. In your attempt to be somebody, you have even stepped on just everyday people. In your attempt to get noticed, you've put other people down. The lure of fame and power is real. Human statistics. Two psychologists did an unpublished study on power and the effects of power on people. In this experiment, they asked three people to discuss a political issue and make political, not political, make policy recommendations. They had three participants in each study. One was classified or given the role of judge, while the other two were assigned to giving ratings and coming up with recommendations. They placed the judge in a higher power position relative to the other two people. About 30 minutes into every discussion, they would put five cookies on a plate. Y'all know three people, five cookies. How many cookies can they all eat? Three people, five cookies. What do you think happened? What they observed was that the person that was in higher power significantly more often ate how many cookies? They got there too. Whereas the two of the lower position, one of them would always defer to only one cookie. In addition, what they noticed in this study, the person in the higher power position was more likely to eat with their mouth open and to leave crumbs on the table. <laughs> their observation and conclusion was power affects us all. Power, uh, power impacts us. It tempts us to take more cookies for ourselves. Power tempts us to leave messes for other people to clean up. That was Jesus' conclusion as well. There's a challenge for us in this scripture, and here it is. Instead of being allured into power, I want mine. Let's give it away. Like the influenced Camille, he dropped one million from the scry, and he let people grab it. He just dropped one million out of this crane from the sky. I don't know how many of you all saw that. Am I, I'm the only one? <laughs> okay. Y'all are not going to believe me in a minute. But he dropped one million. Participants had to sign up, and there were all these people in the field, and it was like an adult Easter egg, and they could grab their money. But like that, let us share power liberally. Let it fall. Let it ooze. Of all the energy we put in ourselves and in our families, maybe we could put some of that energy in others. In other words, instead of lifting yourself up, lift somebody else up. It's good to love oneself. It's good to be good at self-care. It's good to go get those massages. It's good to go on vacation. It's good to have your TV show. It's good to eat your favorite food. But these religious leaders had gone too far, and maybe, maybe, maybe we as humanity have too. And Jesus was calling them to take a step Take a step back, get off of you, and get into someone else. Balance, perspective. Jesus was on the offense, and such he told the religious leaders off. 
Our world is hungry for empathy and understanding. There are so many people in our world hungry for real community and relationship. There are so many people starving for love and affection. You might even be one of them yourself. This week I was listening to a senior who has raised her family. Her kids are on their own. Grandkids are doing their thing. And she confessed, I'm lonely. You know, I've done my thing. I work. My kids are doing their thing. They're too busy. And she says, I'm preparing myself for the holidays. I'm getting myself ready. But I'm feeling it already. I'm feeling lonely. I threw in a few ideas to help her out, and she responded to me, I don't need time fillers. I need loneliness fillers. I'm hearing this story more and more from folks feeling lonely. There's a real opportunity here for the church to lift people up. We have two churches that rent from us, the Orthodox Church on this, uh, on this side. Sometimes you can smell their incense burning. And then we have Holy Vessel on this side. And let me say, Holy Vessel, to get to my office, I have to go kind of sideways through their church. And they are so kind. They're so good-natured. Actually, both of the churches, just wonderful spirit. So a few weeks ago, I come in, and there are these migrants. And they're looking for a Spanish-speaking service church, which... Holy Vessel is not Spanish-speaking. We're not Spanish-speaking, and the the Orthodox Church is not Spanish-speaking. So they're trying to work with these three families. Um, The moms are here, the kids are here, and there's someone in Holy Vessel that speaks about 40% Spanish. So they're trying to have a conversation with them, trying to figure out what they need. Um, And they stay. And one of the ladies at Holy Vessel pulls out an envelope, and she starts giving cash to each of the families. And I thought, oh, my God, that was so beautiful. Week number two, they come back, and Holy Vessel has typed up a whole three-page of places they can go, services they can get for people that speak Spanish. Except you got to get on the bus to get there. And these folks are walking. They're walking all the way from where you walk, Barbara, to get over here. And they're not interested in getting on a bus. They go to Sunday school. They take their kids to Sunday school. As much as possible, they hang with the service, but they stay. Week number three, they come back. This morning, I walked in, and they were like, they're back. They're here, Charlene. And I was so excited to hear that these three ladies that speak Spanish with their kids had found a space. Holy Vessel, in their kindness, not their ability to speak Spanish, but in their kindness, has shown empathy toward these three families. They understand what it means to embrace the stranger, not ask questions, not get involved politically, but simply to be church and embrace a stranger. The ladies are now looking for work, and all three have told us they're from Venezuela. One of them has a work card. There are people in our church, by the way, looking for work. If you need to get your Christmas tree up, you need leaves picked up, if you need help around the house, please see me, because I know people that are looking for work, both in our church and these ladies. But Holy Vessel is helping to lift people up, and I'm so excited. Now, if you are already lifting others, keep the good work up. If you already got your plate full, we don't want you to put any more stuff on your plate. I am deeply grateful for the work you do, and I thank so many of you here that have lifted others up. We have some awesome volunteers and some beautiful hearts in our congregation. So thank you, thank you. But if you get a call, you got a little bit of space, lean into that whole notion of lifting others up. Instead of holding on to power for yourself, which we do get clingy and we are selfish, and that's a part of our DNA, give away liberally power to others. Toot your own horn less. Because this text says you don't have to toot it. Let others toot it. Don't go seeking it. It can be simple, and sometimes it can be so complex. And the story that comes in for number one, for humility this week, for lifting others up, this judge had a veteran. It's actually called the Veterans Court. And they would see veterans kind of struggling in life, and so they set up this court. And this guy had been to war. Um, 
but the war had not left him. He went to war in Vietnam. He had earned two, two Purple Hearts. He went into combat repeatedly. And while each combat brought him honor, he says each combat also brought him pain. He had seen so many comrades killed. He reports, I lost so many friends in Vietnam. He said, once I lost my whole crew. I was stuck to the vehicle, couldn't get loose. He was eventually wounded, requiring surgery, and that ended his time in war. But even though he came home, he suffers from PTSD. And one of the things he finds that helps his PTSD is, take a guess, alcohol. And so he had gotten caught a couple of times with a DUI, and he ended up before this judge. The first time the judge was understanding and passed him off, but the judge this time said, hey, Joe, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's his name in the story. Um, I can't let you off. I have to put you overnight in jail. And so he sentences him to jail overnight. He knew he had to do this. He knew he couldn't let him off. And so Joe is put in the cell, and he's like, he doesn't know how he's going to do it because being in the cell reminds him of being in Vietnam. And he doesn't know how he's going to make it through the night. And then something happens. There's a clink of his jail cell. And the judge shows up. And the judge is there, and like the workers are like, what you doing here, judge? And he's like, I'm going to stay in the cell with Joe tonight. And they were like, you can't do that. And the judge was like, yes, I can. I'm a veteran, and I know what it's like to be in a cell. And so they find a bigger cell, and they put Joe, and they put the judge in there. And the judge says to him, we are in this, we're in this foxhole together. They spent the whole night talking to one another about what it was like to serve in Vietnam. The next day, the guys let him out of jail, and the judge drives Joe home. Three people were forever changed. The worker on duty that night, the judge, and Joe. Simple things can help to lift people up. What I love about being a Christian is no matter which direction you're headed in, all things considered, you can get turned around in the right direction. Christianity, the tenets of Christianity ground us. It reminds us when the world is dancing in a frenzy that we are rooted in love and grace and that we are rooted in God's mercy. And we might find ourselves like Jesus on the offense Come on now, somebody keep it real. But eventually we find our way to humility. And we remember, except for the grace of God. Hallelujah, there go I. Second chances are real, and mercy, and, and grace are real. And we've come this far, no turning back. And we are in this foxhole together. And we must and we should lift others up always. Amen.